Access our online videos on Church of Christ and other Campbellite movements on Yahoo Video. Once on the Yahoo Videos homepage, put Larry Wessels in the search box and click Enter. But the Holy Spirit operates only through the Word. I remind you again that I did not say that it's only the Word, independent, separate, and apart from the Spirit. I am saying simply that the Holy Spirit is operating through the Word, that the Word is His medium. And that is the only way that the Holy Spirit convicts, converts, and sanctifies. I want to remind you, as we get into this study and my affirmity of this evening, again of the questions that were given to Mr. Ross last evening. I mentioned in the very first one that a surgeon and his scalpel are one and the exact same thing. Now, Mr. Ross wants to make that sound like that I am saying that the person of the Holy Spirit is in the Word of God. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach it, so I can't believe it. The point I'm making is that when God gave His Word, the revealed mind of God, the revealed thoughts of God, the ideas of God, why, a vehicle of thought is a word, a sign of an idea is a word. And when God Almighty put His infallible mind in those ideas pertaining to man's salvation of the Word, then it's rather obvious that that Word is with us to this present time. Now, more will be said about that in a moment, but I'm not trying to say at all that the Holy Spirit is in the Word personally. I'm saying that's the representation or the revealing of His mind. It reveals the mind of God to us, and the thoughts of God are certainly strong enough to reach us. Then I want to emphasize this. I gave him this. It's a true or false. I, Bob Ross, know that in the process of becoming a Christian, Saul of Tarsus repented of his sins. He said he knew that. Well, I know it too. But I know how I know it. But I want you to realize he hasn't indicated how he knows it yet. Now, the reason I bring that up will come more clear as we remind ourselves, or those of us who were here last evening, why I would even ask such a thing as that. It's because that this man does not really believe in the rational capabilities of a lost person to comprehend the truth, and he has in his own works, which we shall produce more of as time goes on, indicated that there's some sort of carnal reason in the lost person. Well, I'd like to know the difference of the kind of reasoning he does, because I know he knows or thinks he's sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and yet he doesn't do any different kind of reasoning than the rest of us. So it is that I want to know how he found out that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. There is no explicit statement in the Bible that says Saul of Tarsus, in becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. Now, he said he knew it. I'd like to just know how he knew it. I also pointed out a couple of things that had to do with God circumventing or bypassing the rational and intellectual faculties of man. He said, no, he didn't do that in the process of regenerating him. But yet he turns around and talks about a lost man having to do with uh, the matter of being not capable of receiving the Word and the Holy Spirit only, only through the Word, accomplishing what needs to be done to that person in conviction, conversion and sanctification and so on, we notice those particular points. Now, I've already given him some questions this evening, as he has given me some, and I will at this particular time, chart 41, uh, read the questions that I have given to him for his consideration. Again, I remind you that every explicitly stated or precisely stated proposition is either true or false, and these are true or false statements. There can be no middle ground in them. Now, notice Tuesday night's questions for Mr. Ross. I, Bob L. Ross, can explain the effectual second call of the Holy Spirit to the elect. Now, he can or he can't. He said last night that he had some sort of something happen to him somewhere and something took place. I don't know, he never did put it into words. Well, I'm wanting to know if he can explain just how he was convicted, converted, and sanctified. Just how was it the Holy Spirit did that, Mr. Ross? Then number two, true or false, Paul, that's the Apostle Paul, could fully explain the effectual second call of the Holy Spirit to the elect. Now, true or false, number three, I, Bob Ross, know that the church of the first century apostatized. Now, I want you to indicate, realize that last night, that he indicated that, well, he was for the restoration principle. It would be true if the church could apostatize. And Mr. Ross knows good and well he does not believe in the possibility of apostasy. Of apostasy. He doesn't believe the church fell away in the first century. He doesn't believe that at all. Now, I want to know if the church fell away or it didn't. Now, consider this. Number four, true or false, I, Bob L. Ross, know that rest the restoration principle is biblical. Well, is it? 
Is it authorized by the Bible? Is that principle a Bible principle? That is, that you can restore the Lord's church? Number five, true or false? I, Bible Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because Spurgeon taught it. Now listen to that. I, Bob L. Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because Spurgeon taught it. And six, true or false? I, Bob L. Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because the Bible teaches it. I think that's important to realize on those points. Now, I'd like to notice that as we talk about that restoration principle, that when I went to 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1, and the verses following, and 2 Kings 23, verses 21 through 23, that uh, I mentioned that King Josiah, when they had found the law in the temple, took that law and they were able to restore the Passover. Now, he did that because there was a principle there of God's truth and the law of Moses concerning how they were to conduct themselves before God, and it had been lost. He found that principle, and he followed it. He said, well, you're just simply dodging when these men, like Campbell and others, uh, go wrong on something. Well, I, I don't know why, and he introduced Campbell. I didn't last night. Now, get that. I didn't introduce him because the proposition says the Scriptures teach. And I remind you again, before we go further with this matter, that if Campbell or any of those folks had lived or not lived, I could still sign my proposition that the Scriptures teach. And when you've proven they believed something or didn't believe it, you still have to go to the Bible to find out whether it was right or wrong. And that's just as plain as we're all looking at one another right now. Now, going back to this, he said, well, when he begins to point out that these fellows had this view and that view, which we might or might not hold today, that we're just dodging on the matter. Dodging on the matter... I went down to the very Bible principle that says when something is lost that God has put in His Word that we ought to do, that we can go back and find it, and that it's not just a New Testament thing, but it was done even in the Old Testament. So we need to understand that. And then uh, he seemed to think that he had found something again when he found out somebody who had been taught something in the restoration period of the early uh, 19th century had left Campbell and others. Well, I remind you that the Bible itself records that Demas, after being with Paul for a while, left Paul. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Well, now, are we supposed to quit following Paul's gospel, that inspired truth, that's God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, because Demas quit? Well, that's the case. Let's just forget Jesus Christ, because it seemed to me he had a traitor in that group, too. Now, I'd just like to know, what would Mr. Ross say if Campbell and all the rest had not said anything? Well, last night, seems to me, he couldn't have anything to say unless he could go back in history. I want you to also realize that he missed my point on saying that Martin Luther gave us the Bible. And I said, I'm happy he gave us the Bible. I'll tell you right now. If an atheist sent me the Bible, I'd be glad I had it because I could learn the mind of God and the Word of God capable of penetrating my heart and understanding the truth and be happy and be saved. I don't know what that's supposed to mean when he does that kind of thing. Now I want you to go with me over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. And while we're doing that, please put chart number 44 up on the board. Acts 2 and verse 37. Now when we come over to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we realize that we're at a very special situation. Now, I want you to realize that there had been promises made by Jesus Christ himself to his apostles, to his ambassadors, concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them to guide them into all truth. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. When you come over to Acts chapter 1, Acts 1, chapter 1 again, I say, verses 1 through 5, and on down through verse 8, You'll see promises once again made by the Christ to the apostles regarding where were they to go and wait for the promise of the Father which you've heard of me. And he told them that it would come upon them not many days later. And when you come to Acts chapter 2, you find the Holy Spirit coming upon them in a miraculous way, a supernatural way. That's how God revealed his mind to these folks. And I said last night that if ever... There was going to be a time when God should have supernaturally, miraculously come upon everybody. Sure, it would have been then. Surely it would have been then. But realize that He came upon the apostles. And as they were miraculously guided by the Holy Spirit, then they spoke the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And they reasoned with these people. Now, if it had been according to Mr. Ross, that kind of reasoning couldn't have taken place. It just couldn't have taken place. 
because these folks, being depraved, having inherited Adam's original sin, couldn't comprehend anything that they ought to comprehend and act upon it in any form or fashion to where it would do them any good regarding forgiveness of their sins. But now we find here that these truths were taught by Peter as the Holy Spirit gave him and the other apostles utterance. And proofs are, off that Je- are offered that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now look what happens when you come to verse 37. Read it with me. Now when they heard this, the audience heard the material that was offered by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. They were pricking their heart. It doesn't say now when they felt this, as he said the other night. It doesn't say it was better felt than told. They heard the words of the Holy Spirit and it pricked them in their heart. Now, I don't know what's hard to understand about that. It pricked them in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, what caused them to realize that they were lost? There is not one shred of evidence in all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says that there is a direct operation of the Spirit personally acting upon the inner man to destroy the depravity that's there that he inherited through his father, Adam, and caused him to be blind. And without that working of the Spirit in that way, that he could understand the truth. It'd be impossible, in other words, unless the Spirit did that. That's his position. But notice these folks heard the Word. Whose Word? The Holy Spirit's Word. Now... I've had this chart up here, and the reason why is that you'll notice the very first one at the top of the chart under preaching on Pentecost, Acts 2, 14 through 41. That's what we've been talking about. But look in the case of those converted in Samaria in Acts 8, the eunuch in Acts 8, Saul in Acts 9, Cornelius in Acts 10, the jailer in Acts 16, Lydia in Acts 16. Notice that the Word was preached, and you will find very plainly that in every one of these cases, it was the Holy Spirit working only, only, only through medium, through the Word, to prick these hearts also, even as in Acts 2 and verse 37. Now, I want you to realize we established, go to chart 5, please. He says I can't go back to the Old Testament. Why not? I'd like to know why not. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Peter quoting matters of the Old Testament and saying that that which was happening there was that which had been prophesied by the prophets. And I go find out from the Bible that God has always dealt with man, always dealt with man, even in his pristine purity before he sinned, through words. And I find that the devil recognized very quickly that he was to have to deceive these people, and he told a lie through words. And it had, and uh, Eve had the power, Eve had the ability to either believe the truth of God and keep it, or believe the lie, the falsehood that the devil gave. And she yielded and believed the lie. And when you come on this side of Eden, men who have sinned, there's no depravity that influenced their rational means whereby they could receive the truth of the living God, the seed of the kingdom, the sword of the Spirit. Adam and Eve did after they sinned. No evidence of a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Cain and Abel, who should have very well inherited that original sin, if such were the case, and it is not, then they should have had a direct operation of the the Holy Spirit, and then the Word could have worked. But you don't have that in Genesis 4, 3 through 15. Cain heard the truth and disobeyed it, just like his mother. Abel heard the truth and kept it. And by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Hebrews 11, 4. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. And so we see that on this side of the time that they sinned, and sin came into the world, that all the way down to this present time, the Holy Spirit through, through the Word, leads, guides, and directs people, convicts them of sin, converts them to Christ, and, of course, sanctifies them. Now go to chart number 19, please. I introduced several things on chart 19. One of them was the point one, as we noticed characteristics of the Word of God through which the Holy Spirit operates. Number one, the Word is that which, mark it, furnishes the man of God completely. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, he's wanted to have, he's wanted and said, we have to find a scripture, where we offered him a number of them, that says it's through the Word of God only that the Holy Spirit does these things. Well, I'd like for you to note chart 37, please. Chart 37. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. There the Holy Spirit had Paul write to the young preacher, Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be 
partially given, somewhat given. It only works on you after the Holy Spirit hits you upside the head, personally when He does it, knocks the depravity out of you. It doesn't say that. The Holy Spirit didn't say that. He said it makes a person perfect. And then those next two words, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto some good works. Part of it, a little bit. It says, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, the word perfect, according to Thayer, means complete and perfect. Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich says complete, capable, proficient. That is, able to meet all demands. Able to meet all demands. Well, now, Mr. Ross, does that mean able to meet the demands of destroying that depraved nature that you talk about? Or is it just a partial thing? Thoroughly furnished, Thayer says, to furnish perfectly. Page 222, Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich to equip, furnish for every good deed. Now, I want to ask Mr. Ross, do you believe this? Do you believe it? What happened back over there in verse 37? Those folks heard the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom. And I know that it was that which convicted them of their sins. It pricked them in their heart. That was sufficient. And on a day when miracles were abundant to the apostles by the Holy Spirit, it was the Word given by the Holy Spirit and infallibly guided into the minds of the apostles and given to the people so they could understand it. And that was sufficient. Now, in order for him to disprove these things, in order for him to disprove these things, he must find some way that my reasoning is wrong or that I've misapplied the Scriptures. Or maybe he can just show us someplace in the Bible, in the Holy Spirit's sword, where we have a direct operation of the Spirit to destroy the depravity brought there by the original sin of Adam inherited when you were born into this world, so that you, then you can have the Word of God work on you. Maybe that's the case. So it is that I want to emphasize the next couple of minutes again why Mr. Ross opposes this proposition, why he can't accept the Holy Spirit through the Word. Mr. Ross believes that, number one, chart four, Every person is born having inherited Adam's original sin. I've said that several times. Two, therefore, in the light of that fact, one is depraved and thereby inclined to no good whatsoever. Number three, such is the case because their depraved hearts or minds are so hardened by Adam's original sin that they cannot, they are not able to do anything good for the right reason. Thus, number four, per Mr. Ross's argument or doctrine, the Holy Spirit must personally literally and actually, without any medium whatsoever, contact the heart of man to destroy the depraved nature that he received from having inherited Adam's original sin. It's just that way. Now, very quickly on his um, questions. Number one, he gave me this question. In conversion and sanctification, the Spirit of God operates on persons only through the Word. True. Number two, there are saved people, Christians and other churches, such as Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and so on. False. Three, Calvinism is a matter of opinion, and Calvinists may be fellowship in the church communion. Absolutely false. All inherit, all inherit a fallen, consequently a sinful nature. False. Man's spirit is enslaved to his passions and appetites, and he is in a state which may be described as depravity. False. Now, the seed sown in soil will germinate, grow, and produce after its kind without, he emphasizes without, any additional or accompanying influences such as temperature, air, water, and sunshine. Well, now realize what he's trying to say here. He's trying to say that the air and water and sunshine represents the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to say the seed is the Word of God. And it's going to take the other to work with it. Well, now in recognizing that it takes all elements when it comes down to the seed uh, being placed into the water or other into the ground, water and other things have to be there, then it takes what God decreed to reproduce, seed, water, air, proper soil. But now if he's trying to compare, if he's trying to compare the air and the water and the sunshine of the Holy Spirit operating personally after the seed's been put into the ground, there's no comparison. That's comparing watermelons with monkeys or something. There is no comparison. Now, I'll say false as it stands right here because it violates the very law of what it takes for seed to come up. Now, you remember this. An illustration will only go so far. An illustration will only illustrate just so far. Now, I want you to remember, we are determined to preach the Word because it's the sword of the Spirit. 
It's the Word of God. It's the seed of the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit in conviction, conversion, and sanctification operates only through the Word. Now, you see if he noticed my arguments. You see if he follows them. Or see if we don't get a treatise on Campbell and what he did or didn't do. And how many sticks of wood he could chop. And how many goats he had. And what, something like that. And you'll notice, boy, that's really on the proposition. I think I signed the Scriptures teach, and he signed the negative. It's once again a pleasure for me to be here and address this audience and to dispute with Mr. Brown over the matters about which we differ, and I appreciate your attendance tonight. Hope that you'll continue to come as the debate progresses. If you were here last night, you know that Mr. Brown brought to the podium a little booklet I wrote called The Killing Effects of Calvinism, and he read from it, and he also mentioned that I exalted C.H. Spurgeon. Well, I've also written a book about Spurgeon. It's called The Pictorial Biography of C.H. Spurgeon. And we've published this book, Sermons on Sovereignty by C.H. Spurgeon. And then a little biographical sketch of Spurgeon year by year called Highlights in the Life of C.H. Spurgeon. And since Brother Brown likes to read me and he has respect for Spurgeon, I'm going to give him these as a gift, and I hope you enjoy them, brother. That unmerited favor. That's unmerited favor. <laughs> and that was a that was a direct operation too. The only one we've seen. It it may be the only one you'll see. Who knows? Uh, I appreciate debating with Brother Brown and the uh, good spirit so far in the debate. I have had debates that haven't gone quite uh, as smoothly, but most all the debates I've had have gone smoothly. Sometimes people think that uh, debates is bordering on blooding one another's nose, and I guess there have been some that almost came to that. But it doesn't have to be that way, and uh, with if we have any uh, security about what we believe or confidence in what we believe. I don't think we have to resort to malice and envy and hatred and expressions of that kind in the differences, although we do many times, as has been said, we press our point so that it might appear to someone that uh, we're getting a little out of hand. But nevertheless, that's not intended. Now, in his first speech, uh, I just want to make this comment. Mr. Brown is in the affirmative, and of course he's obligated to be affirming the proposition that he signed to affirm, and he's supposed to be presenting materials along those lines. But uh, he's seen fit to uh, use arguments with regard to what I supposedly believe or what maybe someone else may have believed, which really is irrelevant to his establishing his proposition. All he could prove in referring to what I believe or someone else believed is that we are wrong. Now, he made mention of that last night when I uh, commented about this. And in proving me wrong does not add up to his being right. I hope that you all understand that. Even if I were to stand here on the platform and admit to Mr. Brown that I am completely wrong, or if I were here as an atheist and I said, I do not even believe that there's a Holy Spirit or Word of God or God, this would not accredit his doctrine. What he has signed to affirm is what he's supposed to be endeavoring to prove. Now, he's offered a smattering of material, scripture quotations, references, what he calls examples of conversion and things of this sign, uh, of this type as a part of his effort. But now remember, whatever I believe is irrelevant to establishing his proposition. Understand that. Regardless of what I believe or don't believe, I could believe absolutely nothing, and it would prove nothing for Brother Brown. You do not make a truthful man because you have a dishonest man. You see, the dishonest man must stand on his own ground. He must accredit himself in his own honesty, and not by saying that the other fellow is dishonest. So I hope in listening to debate that you realize that whatever he says that I believe, which uh, most all of it is either a twisted or a distorted or a perverted representation of what I believe, but nevertheless, 
That does not accredit his position, and I want you to understand that. And when I get in the affirmative on Thursday night, I will not be trying to accredit my position by what Mr. Brown believes that I don't believe. I'll be accrediting my proposition on the basis of what I believe the Bible teaches and not on the basis of what Mr. Brown believes that I reject in him. Now, uh, they sometimes accuse me of teaching, for instance, faith only, as they say. And I've called on them for years to give me the quotation, book, chapter, and page number, or tape out of a debate or whatever, where Bob Ross ever taught faith only. And they haven't been able to do it, and yet they go around and they write in their papers and they represent Bob Ross teaches faith only. And if anyone here tonight can produce a statement from Bob Ross in a debate or a book or an article or anything else I've ever written uh, that uh, I teach faith only, well, I'll, uh, I'll give you a book by C. Spurgeon also. But that, that's just to throw in as an illustration that what men sometimes say you believe is not necessarily what you believe. I've been told many times what I believe and what I don't believe, and I've learned some things myself that I didn't know that I believed and didn't believe. And I'm sure you're probably the same way. So you just let that uh, go one ear and out the other so far as what he's claiming about me, and listen to see if he produces any evidence that the Holy Spirit works only through the Word. Now, uh, that chart I have in the front of my box there, brother, would you please put that one up at this time? And I believe it's the one on the questions, isn't it? Now, here's some questions I submitted to Mr. Brown. And uh, while you're perusing those, I'll just quickly answer the ones he gave to me, lest I forget that and be scolded for not answering his questions like Bill Jackson scolded me in Austin. Number one is true to the extent that it's explained in the Bible, and I understand the Bible, I can explain the effectual call of the Holy Spirit to the elect. But I do not claim infallibility like Alexander Campbell and those who say they speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent as if they're perfect in their understanding of the Bible. I can explain it to the extent it's explained in the Bible. Uh, number two is true. Uh, to the extent that Paul explains it in the Scriptures, and I understand those Scriptures. Number three is false. This is the claim of all those who claim they are the restorers, such as the Restoration Movement, the Mormons, the Christadelphians, the Pentecostals, and any other sect or cult or denomination or whatnot. Now, in this regard, I'd like to call Mr. Brown's attention to one of his brethren, Mr. Wayne Jackson, I don't suppose he's kin to Brother Bill, but in the October 1975 Spiritual Sower, he says, Though Mormonism asserts that the church ceased to exist after the apostolic days or ages, the Bible teaches otherwise. And Mr. Jackson, Mr. Wayne Jackson from California, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with him, his face and articles appear in many magazines. He offers this proof. The church could never be destroyed, Daniel 2.44. Ephesians 3.21 says you glorified in the church. The Lord is glorified in the church forever and ever. Hebrews 12.28, the kingdom cannot be shaken. And he refers to Luke chapter 8 and Revelation 14.6 in support of the continuity of the church. And he says some would depart from the faith, but this does not indicate that all would. He says, the persecuted church of the post-apostolic era did not cease to exist, and so on. So that's one of his own preacher brethren, Wayne Jackson, denying that the church apostatized as is claimed by the Restoration Movement, the Mormons, the Christadelphians, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Pentecostals, and others of their uh, category, so-called restorers, as they all claim to be. Now, number four, it's false because the restoration principle that he has in mind here is the interpretation of that principle put upon it by the restoration movement, which excludes the work of the Holy Spirit. It excludes the work of the Holy Spirit. And so consequently, the restoration work that he's talking about, or the restoration principle he's talking about, is not 
uh, the principle that I would have in mind when I would talk about restoration. So it's false because it's not the restoration principle as held by Mr. Brown and the restoration movement that's in the Bible, uh, such as the restoration of the church. Let him prove to me from the Bible and contrary to Wayne Jackson that the church of the Bible ever apostatized and had to be restored. If he proves it, he'll disprove his brother Wayne Jackson, and uh, that might take several of them to hell because Wayne Jackson is preaching all over this country to Restoration Movement churches and writing articles, and he's being followed. Thank you. Now, number five. This is false. Uh, Bob Ross, uh, I, Bob Ross, agree with Spurgeon, what Spurgeon taught only because Spurgeon taught it. Spurgeon did not claim, as did Alexander Campbell, that he was infallible, speaking only where the Bible speaks. And so, therefore, it's false that I uh, agree with Spurgeon only because Spurgeon taught it, because he did not claim any infallibility that would cause me to have that kind of uh, devotion to his teachings. Number six is false. I, Bob Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because the Bible teaches it, because I find myself agreeing with truth in all its forms, whether it's in the Bible or in some other form of knowledge which we're acquainted with in this life. And so if I see the truth in something that appears to me to be true, then I believe it, whether it's in the Bible or outside the Bible or, or somewhere else that I can learn the truth. And if you can't learn any truth but in the Bible, then why did you go to school to learn mathematics? Why did you go to school to learn to read and write? Why did you go to school to learn about medicine? Why do you go to school to learn about automobiles or air conditioning or anything? So uh, I don't uh, agree with Spurgeon just because uh, something's taught in the Bible. Whatever Spurgeon taught that I see to be the truth, whether it's history, whether it's common sense or Bible or whatever, if I see it to be the truth, Bible and other things as well, I agree with that. Now, uh, this chart I have on the board here, I asked him some questions. In conversion and sanctification, the Spirit of God operates on persons only through the Word, and he said, true. Now, let me read you something, Mr. Uh, uh, Brown. He said he'd read part of the Campbell-Rice debate, and I told you last night he was following Alexander Campbell. Listen to this. In conversion and sanctification, the Spirit of God operates on persons only through the Word. That was proposition number five that Alexander Campbell affirmed in the Campbell-Rice debate. And in Mr. Jacks or Mr. Brown said that it's true. So he is agreeing with Alexander Campbell on the doctrine of the Word and the Spirit, as Campbell affirmed it in the Campbell Rice debate. And this is the book that they have taught in the Christian Worker magazine that you should read once a year because it teaches you the truth about the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, am I wrong in saying then that he is in line with and teaching the doctrine of Alexander Campbell? Now, there are saved people, Christians, and other churches such as Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists. He said no. Well, now here he must not have read this in the Alexander Campbell debate. Because in this debate, Alexander Campbell, he says that there will be Presbyterians in heaven as well as uh, those from other churches. So here he goes contrary to Mr. Campbell, and yet they tell you to read this book once a year because it teaches the truth about the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Do you mean, Mr. Brown, that this book does not teach you the truth when it says that Presbyterian Christians and Christians from other churches will be in heaven? Now, number three, Calvinism is a matter of opinion, and Calvinists may be fellowshipped in church communion. He said that's false. Well, now on page 797 in this uh, debate, which they tell you to read, Alexander Campbell here, he says, We long since learned the lesson that to draw a well-defined boundary between faith and opinion, and while we earnestly contend for the faith, to allow perfect freedom of opinion and of expression of opinion is the true philosophy of church union and the sovereign antidote against heresy. Hence, in our communion at this moment, we have as strong Calvinists as strong Arminians as any I presume in this house, certainly many that have been such. 
Now, this man was telling you that in his fellowship he had both Calvinists and Arminians, and it was a matter of opinion and not of the faith. And they tell you in the Christian Worker magazine that this book here should be read once a year because it teaches you the truth about the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And if it does, then we should have Calvinists and Arminians living side by side in peace and holding those things as a matter of opinion and not as the matter of faith, according to them. Now, number four, all inherit a fallen, consequently a sinful nature. He said that's false. Well, now, this book, which is recommended by the Christian Worker magazine... Page 681, Alexander Campbell is quoted here, All inherit a fallen, consequently a sinful nature. And they tell you in the Christian worker that this book will teach you the truth. And he says it's false. Now, we've caught him in a log jam here, haven't we? He's between a rock and a hard place. He's got the Christian worker commending this book, and he gets up here and says what this book is teaching is false. They've got Alexander Campbell restoring baptism, restoring the church, and yet here's a man teaching that in this book, and it's false. Now, number five, man's spirit is enslaved to his passions and appetites, and he is in a state which may be described as depravity. Oh, that's false, according to Mr. Brown. But listen to this, again, out of this book recommended by Christian Worker Magazine, of which he's the associate editor, teaches you the truth about the uh, Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Campbell uh, says here that uh, he's captivated by his passions. This is still the depravity of man. His spirit is enslaved to his passions and appetites. Mr. Brown said, if I heard him correctly, that's false. But the book teaches that it's true, uh, or that's the position that the book teaches, Alexander Campbell, and they recommend the book. <coughs> now, seed sown in soil will germinate, grow, and produce after its kind without any additional or accompanying influences such as temperature, air, water, and sunshine. Now, for years, they have, in debates, offered this seed theory to me as if t this teaches the restoration of the church. I said, well, that's fine, but tell me how Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, Barton Stone, and those men obeyed that parable according to the example of the parable. And they didn't even get baptized. Now, how could you obey that parable, have the seed sown in your heart, and restore the church, and you not even get baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. That's what the Campbells did, according to the things we read in the Spiritual Sword, Christian Worker, uh, other magazines, Firm Foundation, Buster Dobbs. But now look here. I brought it up tonight because I'm teaching that the necessity of the Holy Spirit blessing the Word of God when it's preached and when it's taught, when it's read, whatever, is a part of the plan of God in converting people. And when they bring this uh, seed parable up to me, the parable of the sword, they never talk about these additional influences. Friends, I was raised on a farm, and I've raised a garden myself within the past few years. You go out there and you plant that seed. If you don't have the additional influences of temperature, air, water, and sunshine, you're just not going to get many uh, tomatoes or uh, okra or whatever you're raising, squash, it's just not going to do any good, is it? You've got to have these things that will help that seed to germinate. Well, now, uh, Brown says it takes what God decreed. Well, I agree with that. And what did God decree? He decreed to send the Holy Spirit to bless the Word because, as I quoted you last night on the chart, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, it's not in Word only. Not in word only does that preaching or word come. He said an illustration will only go so far. Well, now, Mr. Uh, Brown, are you saying here that the illustration I've given of the seed sown in the soil is going too far when I tell you that you've got to have temperature, air, water, and uh, sunshine? Is that going too far? You people that are farmers, lived on a farm, am I going too far when I say you've got to have other things besides just sticking the seed in the ground? And I'm not going too far when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that you can preach the Word of God, but unless the Holy Spirit of God does His work, 
in having the influence that he has upon the hearts of people, you'll not have a spiritual harvest either. Now, you may not believe that because, as Mr. Brown evidently confesses, he has not had that uh, work of the Holy Spirit in him. And I can understand why he would not be aware of it if he hasn't. But do not deny it, Mr. Brown, simply judging the experience of everyone by your own experience. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I again am happy to stand before you in the affirmative of this. I think the proposition is the Scriptures teach that in conviction, conversion, and sanctification, the Holy Spirit operates only through the Word. I want to look at some of the things that he says and notice the questions, but I want to remind you that he didn't touch a thing on the argument I said regarding Acts 2.37. Did you even hear it? He didn't say a thing about 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. Did you hear it? Now, he wanted to say something to me about my obligation of the affirmative. I offered an affirmative argument. He may want more. But we give him more if he'll just answer one. Just one. Just one, Mr. Ross. I don't think that's asking too much. If you can talk to me about what my obligation is as the affirmative speaker, surely you realize you're to follow the arguments that I offer and deal with them. I told you you'd be after with Campbell. Well, we missed it when he didn't have Campbell chopping wood, but he did just about everything else with Campbell, and I don't think we've heard the end of it yet. I'll say again, if Campbell had never lived, what difference would it make tonight about being saved? Any of those men had never lived. We have the Bible tonight. We're here tonight. Now, are we going to know what he said and do what he said? Now, Mr. Ross doesn't understand why I refer to his position. Well, part of understanding why people stand for something or oppose something is know just exactly their thinking on it. That's the only reason. And if I have done anything that uh, is contrary to what he believes and given something that's contrary to his beliefs, I told him twice last night, feel free to correct it. Well, he said most of it's misrepresenting and twisting. Well, tell me where I've twisted and misrepresented. So I, I, wish, I wish really. You know, he said I, I'd given a smattering of proof. Well, please, Mr. Ross, just notice the smattering. And I'll be happy if you'll just deal with the smattering. That would make me feel so good. Now, I didn't say one thing. Now, I ask you to please listen. I did not say one single solitary thing about the subject of faith of any kind regarding how he addressed it. He said some people that you accuse him of faith alone or faith only. Well, he wants to make a big to-do over that. I still said... And that's what I'm up here to do. The Scriptures teach that in conviction, conversion, and sanctification, the Holy Spirit operates only through the Word. Now, I, I just don't know what else to say along those lines because that's exactly the situation. That's what I'm up here to do. I'm trying to do it. I'm trying my best to do it. But what good does it do? Now, let me go to the questions I gave him and look at his answers. He says... True to I, Bob L. Ross, can explain the effectual second call of the Holy Spirit to the elect as far as the Bible goes. That's all I'm saying, is that you can just explain it as far as the Bible goes. Oh, he doesn't claim infallibility like Campbell does. Now, he talks about us going to proofs, proofs to try to show what somebody, what somebody says. Where can he find Campbell ever in claimed infallibility? Just an assertion. Now, he wants to say, don't assert, but he asserts. Well, then he says, number two, Paul could fully explain the effectual second call of the Holy Spirit to the elect. That's interesting. I think that's going to come back to haunt him. I believe that he did also explain it. Now, I'll give you a hint. I think he wrote it down in the Bible so we could understand it. And I may give you a hint of what's to come. Then he says in three, this I, Bob L. Ross, know that the church of the first century apostatized. He says, I have a view of the restoration principle that's not like his. Not like his at all. Well, why did you say then that the restoration principle, as you did last night, was true? I thought that it just simply meant if you've lost something, you could find the blueprint of it and you could have it again. Now, that's all I know it means. Why, if somebody wanted to build a building like this one or some other edifice, and they had lost the blueprint and then they found it, couldn't you go by that blueprint and have the same thing restored? That's all I mean by it. He says it's not true because we don't claim the Holy Spirit has a part to do with what we're doing. Now, where have you heard me say that? Because I say the Holy Spirit operates through, through, through a medium, he doesn't think that the restoration principle is of the Bible. Well, I don't know why I've pointed out over and over again that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, the Father and the Son being the first and second person. 
I pointed out very plainly that the Holy Spirit operates through the Word of God. I suppose if he were to tell his wife good night, that that'd be direct. Still be through the Word. But if he wrote her a letter, she wouldn't know it. That'd make a whole lot of sense. If he wrote it down, I don't understand that too well. He says also, and let's see, that um, number five, I, Bob L. Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because Spurgeon taught. He says, no, that's not right. Well, that's fine. That's good. And that's exactly the way I am and try to be about other people in the past. I don't just accept what they wrote or try not to because they wrote it. Now, will you not allow me the same liberty you have? I don't know why. Then he says, six, I, Bob L. Ross, agree with what Spurgeon taught only because the Bible teaches it. And he said, false. Well, did you learn how to be saved from a math book? I didn't know we were talking about learning mathematics and trigonometry and whatever else. Uh, That's just a dodge. He knows good and well I'm talking about learning how to be saved from God's infallible Word, and it's that kind of truth. Jesus said, If ye continue in my Word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Will or it won't. It's powerful, it's not. It'll do what Jesus said it would do if you'll study it, believe it, and obey it, or it won't. Jesus lied or He didn't. The Holy Spirit works through it to accomplish what Jesus said it would work, or it won't. And He doesn't. I don't know what's hard to understand about that at all. Now, I want you to realize that when he begins to talk about my answers, the questions, you come down to number one, his questions. And I think that's Q1, I believe, chart. In conversion and sanctification, the Spirit of God operates on persons only through the Word. I said true. Well, he says, I agree with Campbell on that. Well, I've already told you, I don't mind agreeing with anybody on something. If it comes down to the fact that they got it from the same source book of truth regarding salvation I got it from, what's wrong with that? I want you to notice, he believes in the God of the Bible. I believe in the God of the Bible. Now, does it make either one of us right because we agree with one another or because it's taught by God? Well, now, you know the answer to it. And besides that, he agreed with Campbell on the meaning of ecclesia. Does that make him a Campbellite? No. Not at all. I guarantee you that. Although he's more infatuated in all this stuff than I've ever seen any of our brethren. And there are saved people, Christians, and other churches such as Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, so forth. He begins to talk about Campbell and all these folks. I said last evening that when those folks were trying to come out of those things, when they were trying to come out of that, you can find different places in their life where they had all sorts of different views and error. Now, in the middle of the McCullough debate, We have Robert Richardson in his memoirs of Alexander Campbell saying this about Mr. Campbell, and part of it is a quote on page 88. Page 88. During the progress of the discussion, finding the denominational spirit growing stronger and stronger, being almost overwhelmed by a profuse outpouring of Baptist compliments, more than we've got tonight, Baptist compliments, he had thought it best on the evening of the fifth day to state candidly and fairly to the principal Baptist preachers the exact position which he occupied. Being all assembled in a room at Major Davis's, where he stayed, he introduced himself fully to their acquaintance in the following manner, as related by himself. And this is Richardson in his memoirs of Alexander Campbell, now quoting Campbell. And I quote, Brethren, I fear that if you knew me better, you would esteem and love me less. For let me tell you that I have almost as much against you Baptists as I have against the Presbyterians. They are in one thing and you in another, and probably you are each nearly equidistant from original apostolic Christianity. He said, I paused, and such a silence as ensued, accompanied by a piercing look from all sides of the room, I seldom before witnessed. Does that sound like a man, unless he just outright lied, And all liars have their place in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, 8. And he knew he was lying, so he just told that. I told you that you can go back into any of these men's lives at different parts of their life as they were studying themselves out of human churches, and you can find them believing various errors. Now, what does that prove? I know how he felt here, and I know in the McCullough debate, when he was pointing out that baptism was a burial, the Baptists got all beside themselves, and they thought he was just totally on their side. He didn't want them to think that didn't want them to think that at all. So I would suggest to you, when Campbell said, Brethren, I fear that if you knew me better, you'd esteem and love me less, that Mr. Ross has come to know him better and esteem and love him less. So I suggest 
Again, we have, we're drawn to have to mention some of these things because they're brought up. We'd rather not, but we didn't introduce it. We didn't introduce it at all. I want that to be understood. I'm still trying to take the position very plainly as I sign to do, as I sign to do, that the Scriptures teach that in conviction, conversion, and sanctification, the Holy Spirit operates only through the Word. Now he comes down and says Calvinism is a matter of opinion and Calvinists may be fellowship in the church communion. Well, you saw what Campbell said as he was studying himself out of that. And he rebuked me for agreeing with him, but he also rebuked me for disagreeing with him. I can't please you, Mr. Ross. Which way can I go? Tell me. Agree with him or disagree with him? Which way? What do you want me to do? Well, the truth of the matter is it won't make any difference. But here's what you better agree with. Here's the source of it. What did he say when I said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And David said, all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. That the man of God may be somewhat perfect, nearly complete, almost thoroughly furnished into some good works. He doesn't say that. It just does not say it. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse 48. So I think I know something about those things. He says also, He gave me this question, All inherit a, fall, all inherit a fallen, consequently a sinful nature. And I said, false. I told you why he believed what he did. There is nothing in the Bible that teaches that kind of thing. We showed you from the chart back over there having to do with Eden, chart 5, that before the fall, while man was pure and sinless, God directed and guided him by words, and man could either believe and follow those words and stay in a sinless condition, or could follow the devil by believing and obeying a lie. Eve believed and obeyed a lie that the devil put to her in words. Then after the fall, you do not find any kind at all, no kind at all of a direct operation of the Spirit, so they could then attend to the words of God. You just find the record saying that as sinful people, God still gave them their words, and Cain and Abel, who should have inherited this so-called original sin and been depraved, all we have is that they had the Word of God through which the Spirit guided and directed them, and it said plainly in the New Testament, as an example unto us, under the teaching of Christ, how we should follow follow his words, that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and it was by faith he did so, but faith comes by hearing the word of God, and no other source. Romans 10, 17, he, again, Hebrews 11, 4. What did he say about that? Silent as a tomb, and silent as an oyster. They both just about have as much to offer. Man's spirit is enslaved to his passions and appetites, and he's in a state of depravity. That's false. Then he wants to spend a lot of time on seed. I told you what he would try to do by paralleling temperature, air, water, and sunshine. He says that's the Holy Spirit. The seed's the Word of God. I pointed out plainly last night from Hebrews 4.12, Now the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the uh, joints and marrow, of the spirit and the heart, the spirit and the soul, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You believe that? Well, whether you do or not, it's still true, because the Bible said so. You ever see this little bumper sticker that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's not right. God said it, and whether I believe it or not, that settles it. And that's exactly how it goes down. And so I'm simply pointing those things out. What's my time again? Five. I want you to notice something further. This, uh, just notice something further. This is his book, The Killing Effects of Calvinism. I'm almost tempted to take off on that, but I won't. The whole point is is that when you look into this book, you can find out just exactly what he really believes. On page 10, I want to tell you what guides him in his view of sanctification, that that Holy Spirit personally, as he claims, is indwelling him. Here's what he says on page 10 of this book, The Killing Effects of Calvinism. He wrote, quote, now notice this is a quote, Mr. Ross gave us his thoughts in his words. We are not to approach his word to understand it. Through the power of reason, but through His Spirit's blessing us with understanding. Chart 13. Now John wrote in 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. 
No wonder we can't get anything done. But is the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in Him. Well, in that same chapter, in that same chapter, just a few verses earlier, He says, But ye have an unction, ye have an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And that's in verse 20. Verse 20 of that same chapter. And he gets up here and talks about Alexander Campbell claiming to know these things. Is this, is this what you're claiming, Mr. Ross? You're claiming this unction from the Spirit? I thought that that was one of the miraculous gifts that came through the laying on the apostles' hands. And you said last night, you didn't believe in miracles that way. Now, you did say that. I don't think I misunderstood you. This is the miraculous gift of knowledge. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 8. And he has the audacity to get before this audience and say... Why, Alexander Campbell claimed that he was infallible in his knowledge. Well, if anybody ever could claim infallibility, it's somebody that's got the Holy Spirit giving them what John said these folks had. Why, you don't know wonder we can't teach anything. He knows everything. Well, you look at him right now. He's studying. He'll have his Bible open. Think the Holy Spirit needs help. Now, folks, I don't just say that to be mean and put him down, because what he said earlier, in fact, I enjoy him, and I think he knows that. We haven't been around one of them very much, but we're talking about the doctrine he holds. And he's talking about the doctrine that I hold. And he knows that, and I know that, and I hope you know that. But it just won't wash, as somebody says. It just will not wash. So we're not to approach his word to understand it through the power of reason. That's what he wrote. And since he's anointed the Holy Spirit, I guess it's true. We ought to put this in as first Ross. 1 Ross chapter 1, verse 1. Through the power of reason, but through His Spirit's blessing us with understanding. Well, as Miss Ross is going to claim the other miraculous gifts, chart 14, again, the second part. Is he going to claim the other miraculous gifts listed by the inspired Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10? There's the word of wisdom. There's miraculous faith. There's the gift of healing. There's the working of miracles. There's the prophecy, discerning of spirits. Speaking in languages never studied. Tongues. Interpretation of those languages. Now, Mr. Ross, are you actually telling us you know all things and you have those things? Again, of the Bible, Mr. Ross says this on page 10 in this little book, The Killing Effects of Calvinism. Killing something. It's not a book to be proved by reason, but a book for those of faith. Now, that day he told you something. Because he challenged me just a while ago to say, you shouldn't challenge another person's feelings and experience. That's subjective. That means however you feel, whatever you think, whatever goes on in your mind, that's right. No matter if somebody else feels and thinks some other way. And that's where all this stuff goes. And most of the religion in America that claims Christ is Savior just says you think whatever you want to think and it's all right. Well, why have the Bible in the first place? And why even have all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? Chart 11, that one is. It's not a book to be proved by reason, but a book of those of faith, for those of faith. Folks, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. The Word of God set on our level. It appeals to our rational ability. We gather the evidence in the words. We understand the mind of God in the words. And we reason with those words. And we draw a conclusion. And we act upon that conclusion. And Paul said to the church, as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance in writing to the church in uh, Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, there he said plainly, Prove, 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 prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Now, Mr. Ross, would the Bible or any kind of belief be included in all things regarding how we should prove things? He also wrote, page 10, if we approach the Bible, chart 9, by reason, we cannot be anything but modernist. I said this last night. He didn't say a thing about it last night. Yet he talks about how I should conduct myself in these things. Well, he brings it up. Am I supposed to be dumb and not respond to it? I think not, because this is the reason he doesn't believe that the Scriptures teach that in conviction, conversion, and sanctification, the Holy Spirit operates only through the Word. But it does. He does. He says we can't be anything but modernists. Well, I suggest to you that God invited the sinful Jews to come let us reason together. Now, they could come and reason or they couldn't. His doctrine says they couldn't reason. God said come and reason. I guess God didn't know they couldn't reason. Did God invite the Jews to become modernists when He said come let us reason together? Well, I don't know why in the world that we can't see that. Now, over on page 10, column 1, page or paragraph 4, Bob Ross, The Killing Effects of Calvinism, he calls reason carnal, carnal reason. 
Well, will Mr. Ross explain the difference between the reasoning that he does and what he calls carnal reason? You just watch when you get up here. I'm carnal reason. He's sanctified reason. See the difference. It's the nature of propositional truth that everything that has ever been said by anyone has been said explicitly in just so many words or implicitly or both ways. Is this what Mr. Ross labels carnal reason? Well, you listen and try to reason with you that you can't reason. I want you to try to reason with you that you can't reason and see how reasonable that is. Would Mr. Ross give us a demonstration of reason that's not carnal? Is his part in this debate an example of the Holy Spirit's blessing him with understanding? Now you watch how fast he notices this stuff. And remember, I quoted from his material. Thank you, and please listen to Mr. Holy, I mean, uh, Bob Ross. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.